I think we'd better fit our wits against them and defeat them. Stop! I can't hear you. When a modestly budgeted science fiction series aimed at an early evening audience of mainly children became a national phenomenon, there was a great deal of incentive to continue with the second season. What do you think it is, a space helmet for a cow? Great, now I'm checking to see if the BBC ever made a show called Star Cows. It's a pity, isn't it? Hmm? It's a pity! Mm -hmm. How do you do more of the same but differently? Doctor Who, season two. It's got to be stopped. He must be stopped. <laughs> So it could be in a few moments or a few seconds. Doctor Who's first season was initially envisaged to run for at best a year. Then the Daleks happened and viewers began watching in large numbers, making it almost inevitable that the series would become a continuing one. Some tweaking of personnel and the cast would happen, but with the show going on, two stories made as part of the first season would be held back to kick off the second season of Doctor Who in October of 1964 after an interminable wait in between seasons of seven weeks. Seriously, seven weeks. That's the standard interval between bath days, isn't it? Or was it just me? I do know that smell. Recognize it? Nah, I'm good for at least another three weeks. It might as well be sooner. With the first two stories being held over, they naturally featured the same cast and production team as the first season. The Doctor was still crotchety at times, but had grown attached to his inadvertent travel companions, school teachers Ian Chesterton and Barbara Wright, and he was devoted to his granddaughter Susan. Likewise, William Hartnell was still crotchety at times, but had grown attached to his co-stars William Russell and Jacqueline Hill, and the actress he often treated as though she was his real granddaughter, Carol Ann Ford. Verity Lambert continued in the producer's chair along with story editor David Whittaker, though it would not be long before new people came on board. New blood and new ideas would be the thing that would allow Doctor Who to constantly evolve. Or were all the things that happened planned out for us? But at this stage, Doctor Who was still very much an ensemble show. The Doctor may have had his name on the lease, but the show at this time was still very much a four-hander. <laughs> Planet of Giants was a rare three-part story. But this is one that began as a four-part story. The TARDIS doors open and fly, which seems to be the sort of thing they used to do quite a bit. And when the TARDIS crew land, they soon find they've been shrunk down to an inch. An inch? I mean, the water was cold. Now, if you don't like insects, skip ahead because this season has lots of insects of various sizes. But the mantra seems to have been, as far as insects were concerned, the larger, the better. And if they couldn't be large, then at least have lots of them. Here the crew find very large earthworms, giant ants, a fly and a bee, most of which are dead. Then there are the deafening sounds of full-size people walking, at least some of the time, and a cat. Once they realise the scale of their predicament, the TARDIS crew flick into survival mode, where just getting to the top of a table is a major challenge, where climbing up a drain is a whole episode, and where play acting with large props makes one wonder why one's parents didn't advise one much more vociferously against going to drama school and instead insist that one go into a profession that required less make-believe. Like becoming a fortune teller in a circus. I mean, at least that's a cash in hand business. Well, if we shout very loud, will the people here hear us? No, no, Susan, no, our voices are much too high. It's a different frequency altogether, my child. The main cast actually do quite well, since they've got the better part of the story, with decent special effects for the most part. When studio facilities allowed, you'd have effects like back projection, basically standing the cast in front of a screen onto which either a still or pre-filmed footage was projected. All quite effective in selling the ordeal that the main characters are going through. The other part of the story is that of the full-size characters, most of whose scenes are an ordeal for the audience. For the non-shrunken characters, they're lumbered with terrible dialogue and cliched plotting, which leads to some pretty ordinary acting. I've already geared factories, advertising and all the rest of it to start pushing DNCs. I'm sorry about that, but I can't give you the approval that you want. Putting the handkerchief over the phone receiver as a way to completely change somebody's voice was old hat even then. Yes, I know I'm not usually so enthusiastic, but this is really extraordinary. And there's no way I'm ever going to use that snot covered phone. Maybe if they'd had access to a voice changer. Hello? Is Mr. Whitmore there, please? The plot with a full-sized guest cast involves a government official coming in person to tell somebody from a pesticide company, Forrester, that his new insecticide DN6 is not approved for sale, but that the official will file the report when he gets back from his sailing holiday, which he's beginning directly after leaving. They would be if the company man, Forrester, didn't pull out a pistol and shoot the official. The insecticide DN6 kills everything, not just unwanted insects. 
and Barbara has been poisoned, though she's keeping that to herself. The doctor and company try to intervene, but the best they can do is use a Bunsen burner to detonate an aerosol can, while really the plot is resolved by a busybody switchboard operator sending her policeman husband to arrest Forrester. Back in the TARDIS, they manage to up -res themselves in time for another adventure. Maybe next time they can go somewhere less dangerous. Boy, it's bad. And it was worse. What puzzles me is how cool you are. Planet of Giants was originally completed as a four-part story, and the last two episodes were so dull and lacking in incident, the decision was taken to edit parts three and four into one episode. At the very least, scenes not featuring the Doctor's group are kept to a minimum, though you could get whiplash from the sudden change of pace. It also begs the question, why couldn't they edit these episodes on film more often to help with the pacing? Oh, come on then. The Land of the Giants part is done really well, with designer Ray Cusick's props and sets working quite well. We have a giant cat, we have full-size people with deafening footsteps, some of the time, and an inability for our crew to make themselves understood over a telephone, which honestly isn't far off people trying to order a mini cab to take them home from the pub. Can you hear us? The murder mystery part with the full-size people is truly awful, with trite dialogue, leaden acting, Thomas More's lice-ridden hair shirt had more life in it. It's the first time the crew had landed back in contemporary times, and here they're far better off with the giant insects than trying to match wits with this collection of, look, I won't be rude, however, collectively there's about two and a half wits. Planet of Giants is notable in that it was Dudley Simpson's first story as composer. Simpson would of course score many stories. He'd become the show's default composer for the vast majority of the stories of the 70s. He'd also write theme tunes for The Tomorrow People and Blake Seven. But he'll always be linked to his work on Doctor Who. Officially, my holiday commenced yesterday. I have a small boat down in the harbour and I'm going to make a tour of the rivers of France. The Daleks returning to Doctor Who was no surprise to anyone. I mean, they had made such an impression on viewers in their first story that they're often credited with much of Doctor Who's success at the time. Of course, they were killed off at the end of their first story, but since when has that stopped anyone? Also, <coughs> time machine. The TARDIS lands on the banks of the Thames in London, but it's very quiet and there's not a trace of life. The crew are prevented from leaving by the TARDIS being trapped by falling debris, which is standard protocol. The crew are split up within minutes, which is also standard operating procedure. There are warnings about dumping bodies in the river, and then occasional corpses are discovered. The Doctor and Ian are captured by a group wearing bar stools on their head. Contrary to appearances, they aren't emerging from a pub lockdown, but are in fact Robomen, servants of the Daleks. The Daleks have invaded Earth in the future. What a twist of lemon. We are the bastards of Earth. The Daleks have captured the Doctor and Ian and try unsuccessfully to turn them into Robomen. While Barbara and Susan have made contact with the human resistance just as they're about to attack the Dalek saucer. Yes, the Daleks have a giant flying saucer. And it looks about what you'd expect it to look like from the BBC in 1964. The human attack fails to put a dent in the Daleks' plan, and what's worse, it splits our team up even more. Ian links up with someone using the Dalek ship as a minicab. Barbara and her new friend Jenny steal a van to get out of London, while Susan and young resistance fighter David try to get the Doctor out of the city before the Daleks firebomb the place. The Daleks have something going on in Bedfordshire, which would possibly be the first time in history that something was going on in Bedfordshire. Well, maybe that's what they're mining for up in Bedfordshire. What are they doing in Bedford? I don't know, maybe the Daleks just wanted to increase their supply of bread vans. The Daleks' plan is to mine out the Earth's core, with slave labour of course, where they will install an engine and drive the planet around like a spaceship in a plan that seems to be as well thought out as Auntie Beryl's plan to launch a 100% perfect reproduction of the Hindenburg on Guy Fawkes Night. So everybody independently decides to go to Bedford on the assumption that everybody else is going to Bedford. And after a couple of episodes of Terry Nation's adventure stylings, everybody does indeed meet up at the mine, where they try various ways of defeating the Daleks. From Dalek impressions to somehow diverting a giant Dalek bomb. If Terry Nation could imagine it, or perhaps less charitably, remember it from a book he'd read years earlier, then it's thrown at the screen here before the Daleks are apparently defeated in a very thinly veiled rerun of the climax from their original story. A volcanic eruption in England! But the biggest part of the last episode is not the defeat of the Daleks, but what's going to happen to Susan. Susan had become close to a young resistance fighter, David, whose pickup strategy is that he's a fish floater. Or maybe he's looking for a fishwife. 
The doctor has recognized the fish flirting for what it is, since apparently in his youth he often used fish to flirt, and who is he to flout the foundational laws of fish flirting? You either fish flirt or you flounder. The doctor has seen the writing on the wall, or perhaps he was just sick of all this fish flirting. I mean, get an aquarium, you two. The doctor locks Susan out of the TARDIS and bids her goodbye over the communication system. Your future lies with David, and not with a silly old buffer like me. It's a touching scene as Susan realizes her life is about to change, and it is one of William Hartnell's greatest scenes in Doctor Who, which is why, even if you've never seen the Dalek Invasion of Earth, you probably recognize part of this speech from its use at the start of The Five Doctors. One day, I shall come back. Of course, we'll ignore the suggestion that Susan is still only around 15 or 16 during her time in the series and may not have actually wanted to stay with David. David is Scottish, thin, with sticky up hair, and of course walks off with a relative of the Doctor. But no, it's not that Scottish, skinny, sticky up haired David. The Dalek Invasion of Earth is wildly ambitious, but stretches the series' resources beyond the threshold of realistic production values into those of comedy. It can be laughable in places, but can also be admired for the production team trying to make Terry Nation's scripts doable on a budget that was a fraction of what was needed to do the story justice. The Daleks are back, though we still have their numbers bolstered by photographic cutouts. The effects of the spaceship... No, that's not wobbling, that's imbalanced manoeuvring thrusters designed to compensate for... No, it's just shash. Yes, the work of a genius, dear boy. Yes, pretty impressive. The production design is mostly pretty good. The Dalek facilities and sets of destroyed London are very well done. There are times when the strings are showing, but in general you can get reasonably sucked into the proceedings here. The Robomen never fully convince. Your brother, Larry. Think, Phil. I mean, they're suitably zombie-like, but they just come across as bored extras happy to have gotten a few extra quid to have a speaking line. The guest cast are, of course, exceedingly well-spoken, thank you very much. Oh, look, it's Mr. Rumble. I suppose you know the robo-men are on the other side of this machine. The Dalek invasion of Earth is good in places, poor in places, okay in places, and at times just trying too hard. It's spread too thinly, like when you're trying to cover five pieces of toast with jam, but you only have that one little portion that you pocketed from the Taddy B&B estate at seven years earlier. William Hartnell was ill for a spell, so he was hurriedly written out of one episode while he recovered. Where the Doctor was left behind in London while it was firebombed. Huh? Dalek Invasion of Earth being a big draw for that season would feature a fair bit of location filming for a Hartnell era story. The Dalek props had been redesigned for increased mobility and were filmed roaming around landmarks, some of which was only used for trailers advertising the Dalek's return. The thing about the Daleks in London is that they are no longer powered by static electricity, but as the proclaimed masters of Earth, they would be paying the daily congestion charges to themselves. Kill him. The processing of the Dalek voices isn't as effective, with their voices sounding rather nasally, as if they had a head cold, or maybe they just had a head cold. The Daleks have a pet at the mine, the Slither, but we don't like to talk about the Slither or draw attention to the Slither. We do not in any way want to detract from the effectiveness of the Slither. This is the Slither. The plan will run parallel with the Boston Tea Party. Uh, naturally, you already have information about this. Wait, why have I not been informed of this? Susan's departure was at times telegraphed. Once the production team knew that they would return for a second season, one of the first orders of business was to write out Susan. Carol Ann Ford had made it known that she wasn't happy with the way the character of Susan had devolved from the original conception of an alien with a hint of mystery into somebody written like one of the Tomorrow People's younger, more annoying siblings. However, her leaving scene was absolutely marvellous. It is a shame that over the decades, more companions weren't given departure scenes on the level of Susan's. You knew you could never leave her. In 1966, the Dalek Invasion of Earth would be adapted into a feature film. Daleks Invasion Earth 2150 AD took the television series basic floor plan, moved the furniture around, gave it some fancy wallpaper with a budget that was more than enough to make an entire season of Doctor Who, and still managed to fall rather flat. <laughs> the Rescue was a two-part story that served mainly to introduce a new character, Vicky. The TARDIS lands on the planet Dido where a crashed human spaceship has two survivors, Bennett, who appears injured and mainly bedridden, and the orphaned teenager, Vicky. They are being terrorized by a creature called Coquillion. In future, you will go no further than 50 yards from this ship. And then after the TARDIS arrives, 
Barbara and her legendarily itchy trigger finger manages to kill Vicky's pet, while Ian tries not to be turned into a kebab. Doctor, the razor sharp! The doctor discovers that Bennett is not quite what he seems, which isn't good news for Bennett, as the doctor happens to know about Dido. Well, undoubtedly we've landed on the planet Dido. All you want to know about Dido, then just ask the doctor. But remember to say thank you. Bennett hides out from the doctor because he's now the hunter. Bennett was a murderer who did not want to face justice. As he said, don't think of me. Vicky doesn't really want to be rescued. She doesn't want to leave Dido because she's honestly okay. Though perhaps she has a martyr complex because in her words, she's no angel. Look, let's just cut time and do this. And I won't go. So you thought we'd forgotten. <laughs> So, without the Dido references, Bennett wears a ceremonial mask to pretend he's Coquillian, but really he was a murderer who killed all of the Didoans and the rest of the crew to avoid punishment. The rescue is not a terrible story by any means, but it just feels so wrong that we have this genocidal killer being Vicky's roommate. I mean, it happens more often than you'd think. Are you finished? Yes, I had hoped that you would continue. The idea that Coquillian was Bennett all along is a sort of decent twist, though looking back, the theatrical subterfuge does seem a touch overly dramatic. Australian actor Ray Barrett made his only appearance in Doctor Who, though at the time he was a regular voice artist for Jerry Anderson productions like Stingray and Thunderbirds. No! Honestly though, Barbara's killing of Vicky's pet and the Doctor telling her more or less just to suck it up does seem rather harsh. Bennett murdered my father. Vicky was an orphan teenager from the 25th century, where her scientific knowledge far outstripped that of her 20th century companions. We worked upwards from the three R's. Oh, it was a nursery school. It was not. At times she would find Ian and Barbara rather quaint and patronise them at times. Where she implied their level of advancement was on par with a Neanderthal's essay on the workings of the internal combustion engine. It go. How? No idea. The way you spoke, I thought we were going to have adventures and see things. Maureen O'Brien was a young actress who quickly learned to hate the attention that came with a role like Doctor Who. While she'd have a long career as an actress, she'd also become a successful mystery novelist. Thank goodness for that. I didn't really see myself as a veritable strutting peacock. The show's first story editor, David Whittaker, wrote this on the way out the door, handing the story editor's job to Dennis Spooner, who coincidentally would write the next story. Though, from a production point of view, the two stories were mostly made as one production. That is the best I can do, I'm afraid. The Romans is a comedy story, and an outright comedy in places. Is that your liar? Why, why have you lost them? Mm. The TARDIS crew have been relaxing in a villa for several weeks when the Doctor and Vicky decide to head for Rome. And then after some people attack them, and Barbara clocks Ian on the head with an urn, Ian and Barbara get mixed up in their own plot lines, where, okay, the school teachers are captured and sold into slavery, Ian has to row on a Roman galley, and later fight in the arena while Barbara is a servant in the household of Nero, the unhinged Roman Caesar. Meanwhile, the Doctor is mistaken for a famed liar player, Maximus Petullian, who had planned to assassinate Nero. Nero, on the other hand, finds Petullian, famous musician, could eclipse his own and wants to have him killed. While the real Petullian had already been killed, it was now the Doctor's turn. The Doctor tries various means to avoid revealing the fact that he can't actually play a liar. The music is so soft, so delicate, that only those with keen perceptive hearing will be able to distinguish this melodious charm of music. I dig, I once did that on stage at Glastonbury, which worked well enough at the time, but unfortunately it meant that sales of our live album were disappointing. Nero has a plan to rebuild his ideal version of Rome, one that perhaps has more Starbucks, but he's blocked from doing so unless somehow Rome actually needs rebuilding. You are a genius, a genius! I will make you rich, rich! Rome is burnt down and wink wink, it might actually have been the doctor's fault. The farce-like nature of the script means that Ian and Barbara would never cross paths with either Vicky or the doctor in Rome. All it's missing is the studio audience. Barbara, <laughs> what was it? Hmm? Ants eggs in hibiscus honey. What did you say? 
Of course, the farce-like nature of the script means that Ian and Barbara never cross paths with either Vicky or the Doctor whilst in Rome. As a representation of Rome recreated in a television studio, the Romans mainly works, though this depiction of the gladiators in the Colosseum does seem a trifle comical. We say a Colosseum, it's really a corner of a hexagonal Colosseum, which seems architecturally anachronistic. When you see a story called The Romans, you expect to see something of the grandeur of Rome. Not some tits and togas wrestling in a tiny set that could have been built in Grandma's front room. Also, you better not be using the good swords. Who, Vardis may not be a Technicolor epic of the sort that had been popular in the 50s and early 60s, but it does the job well enough. It's Ben-Hur's younger, less expensive stepbrother, Len-Hur. But it does seem a bit of a waste. Bye. Next up is the web planet. So you aren't at all put off by giant insects, are you? Because if so, you might want to sit this one out. You will die! In the web planet, the TARDIS is drawn to the planet Vortus where the Doctor and company initially find breathing a little difficult. Like running upstairs after a heavy meal while wearing a corset while also carrying the shopping. Barbara is under some hypnotic spell thanks to some strong magnetic force controlling her via her bracelet. Ian's pen goes flying off in search of a better episode. While the Doctor melts Ian's school tie in some acid for a bit of a laugh, I suppose. Poor Vicky seems to be an afterthought in the plot, so she doesn't really do all that much apart from practice her TARDIS lurching, which is a very important skill. And any resemblance to dancing the time warp are purely coincidental. We will meet all manner of insect creatures. The ant-like Zabi are drones, controlled by some evil force, the Animus, who immediately subject the Doctor to the Cone of Silence. Ian and Barbara variously meet the Monoptera, displaced butterfly-like creatures who are trying to take back their planet, but with all the success of the Royal Shakespeare Company's ill-advised production of Cats. Barbara tries to organise the Monoptera, where she encounters some resistance, until she lets them eat her cardigan. Ian and his butterfly bestie go underground and meet the Optera. Just when you thought this story couldn't become any more pantomime-like, here are the Optera. <laughs> Ambition and a BBC budget are a bit like salt and water. Both very useful in different ways, but mix them together and the likely result is your lunch making an encore appearance. Web Planet was a story that went out on a limb and ended up with another type of limb encased in plaster. I do appreciate the effort to make the insects of Vortus feel completely alien. They have their own ways of moving and speaking and inserting consonants in weird places. We have placed our faith in the isoptope. The web planet's attempt to imbue the various insectoid creatures with specific non-human personalities can make this feel more theatrical than was perhaps intended. The web planet, in short, comes across as a little bit silly. But if you put this in a novel, it would probably work far better. Which may explain why the web planet was one of three stories novelized in the 1960s. The Zabi did not take off as a rival to the Daleks, but they did make one cameo, sort of. Our wise men have put all their skill into this one isotope. Monoptera actor Martin Jarvis was at the start of a very long career in film and television, where he would, of course, make multiple appearances in Doctor Who. If at all you ever discover you need some Vaseline to put on a scrape or a cut but find it's out of stock, it's because the BBC used all of it up to smear all over their camera lenses to help give Vortus an otherworldly look. Come along, drop this. Or the Crusade was a costume drama, which was something the BBC could do very well at this time. Well, what we should say is something the BBC could do very well, very cheaply at this time. The TARDIS lands in Palestine during the Crusades, and of course the crew are split up. Barbara is kidnapped with one of King Richard's friends, while the Doctor and Vicky hang out with King Richard, and Ian goes off to try and rescue Barbara. We dub you... Sir, Ian. King Richard isn't the friendliest fellow where he's not super keen on helping Barbara and is instead concentrating with marrying off his sister to Safadin, the brother of Richard's enemy, Saladin. Well, as a four-part story set during the Crusades, it's fine enough. The dialogue and the acting tends to hold up very well, even if the casting does sort of make it look like the BBC was going nuts with fake tan, or perhaps they were trying to trademark the Klingons before Gene Roddenberry did. Bernard Kay had already appeared earlier in the season as one of several Doctor Who stints, though his audition for Gowron, leader of the Klingon Empire, did not yield 
reveal the results he hoped for. Jean Marsh would also do a few more Doctor Whos and would also create Upstairs Downstairs. Julian Glover was already a get for Doctor Who and he'd be an actor who'd appear in practically every major franchise that we would cover on this channel. Doctor Who, Blake 7, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Game of Thrones, James Bond, and not shown his deleted scene from Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory as an Oompa Loompa with a thyroid condition. The Crusade is the only story of the second season where not every episode exists in the BBC archive. Episodes 2 and 4 only exist as off-air audio recordings and still photographs. Which, while a bummer for people who love the story, it does actually mean that this is the most intact season of Doctor Who from the 1960s. So there are more insects, though this time they're normal size. In the final episode, which is of course missing, Ian is staked out in the desert with ants crawling all over his arm. William Russell said no thank you very much and a production assistant stood in. So, if you want ants, that's how you get ants. Of course! Of course. Probably best to get this out of the way up front. The Space Museum is a show with a poor reputation and it's well deserved. It's four episodes, with the first part being almost brilliant. I mean, almost. Something odd has happened in the TARDIS, which of course happens a lot, and is brushed off by the Doctor. We've got our clothes on. Well, I should hope so, dear boy, I should hope so. Yeah. Who seems oddly not curious about what the hell's going on. The ship lands near a space museum on the planet Xeros, but pretty soon the TARDIS crew realise that something's wrong. Their feet don't leave footprints in the dust, the locals don't seem to be able to hear them or see them, and they don't appear to be fully corporeal. Then the kicker is they find copies of themselves as exhibits in the space museum, leading the Doctor to surmise they've somehow skipped ahead of themselves in time, and once time catches up to them, they'll have very little time to quickly find a way of avoiding becoming embalmed exhibits in the near future. This sounds great, and then the rest of the story is really, really poor. I mean, really, really poor. Well, I've got two more millions before I can go home. Yes, I say it off enough, but it's still 2,000 Zeron days. And it sounds more in days. The locals are all very young men who've been given poor information about eyebrow care, while the alien Moroks, who have conquered the planet, all seem to be dressed like Elvis impersonators. Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do now. Vicky reprograms a security computer that has more backdoors than Uncle Reg's PC after that nice young tech support from Linux Microsoft called him on his landline and remotely installed some updates for him. Well, from my observation, it uh, seems to uh, arouse uh, very little interest. The doctor hides out in a Dalek at one point, and later on is nearly embalmed by Governor Presley. Barbara spends an episode coughing after being gassed, and Ian gets in a nice fight. It's possible that the Space Museum has some of the least effective performances from its guest cast. I'm sure Darko and your friend Barbara have been captured. Well, they need time to dodge the guards. Yes, Doctor, you are quite correct. And it would appear that I shall have my wish. But in a season that includes Planet of Giants, it's not the worst. These aliens, they've made fools of us. Several actors here would appear in Who again, but in particular this actor, Jeremy Bullock, would later wear Boba Fett's armour in the Star Wars films of the 80s. Well, that is why we hide here and plan. The first episode was really interesting, with an actual plot involving time. Time has gone wrong. And then the following three episodes are a poorly written and terribly acted runaround about some drama students trying to overthrow Elvis-obsessed abattoir workers. Disappointing seems to cover it, yet doesn't completely convey just how amateurish this story comes across. We did, but he fooled us. Then the Morocks caught him. Oh, we didn't hand him over to them, if that's what you're thinking. Good lord, where do we start? <laughs> Firstly, the chase, for its many faults, is a hell of a lot of fun, but it's also terrible in places and sloppily made much of the time, which sounds like that summer where I worked in a whiskey distillery and fell into a vat. I won't bore you with the details of how long I stayed there, but when they say age 12 years, they are not exaggerating. Yeah, it's a bit far-fetched. The Doctor had liberated something from the Space Museum, the Time Space Visualizer which is basically a giant device centered around the very largest television screen that Curry's sold at that time. Here it can let you watch any event in history. So we start with the first fake American accent in Doctor Who's history, with a decent version of Abraham Lincoln reciting the Gettysburg address in a desert. Then we see Shakespeare meeting Elizabeth I and getting the idea for Hamlet. And then a clip of the Beatles singing on television. Well, they're marvellous, but I didn't know they played classical music. Which, depending on how you watch this, may or may not have been excised. The TARDIS lands on a planet that looks suspiciously like the BBC's idea of Gettysburg. The TARDIS crew is, of course, split up. The planet is, 
well, look, it's a Terry Nation script, and the place is arid, so the place is called Aridius. An image of the Daleks pops up on the visualizer. The Daleks have their own time space machine and are planning to hunt down and exterminate the TARDIS crew. That's the plot. For the whole six episodes, the TARDIS lands somewhere and then the Daleks show up. Rinse and repeat, which is advice that applies to shampoo and Terry Nation scripts for Doctor Who. A Dalek rises up from the sand in a replay of the Dalek rising up from the Thames earlier in the same season. Ian and Vicky are caught underground on Aridius, where they have to contend with the giant testicle monsters. Oh, don't just stand there gaping, you nit! Come on! Man. The Daleks threaten the locals, the Aridians, if they don't give up the TARDIS crew, and the Aridians comply. The Aridian costume and makeup, well, I wouldn't wish that on anyone, apart from, of course, my office nemesis, Alex Smelly. The Aridians seem to have all gone to the same drama school, and one of them is Howell Bennett in an early role. They multiplied too quickly for us. The TARDIS crew escape, leaving the Iridians holding the bag. Meanwhile, the TARDIS is off to some random location, followed by the Daleks. Next stop, the top of the Empire State Building, for no readily discernible reason. When you come up in the elevator, it took you seven minutes. Well, this way down, you want to get down in a hurry, it would take you 30 seconds. Peter Falk's younger, more available brother apparently consented to play a tour guide. Oh, listen, one more thing. It, it just, it'll just take a second. And then, of course, there's Morton Dill from Alabama. Yeah, I guess that's New York for you. <laughs> who, despite his overly friendly manner, says a brief hello to the TARDIS crew before they leave him to face off against a Dalek. Say, so you sure are an ugly looking friend. Though, for whatever reason, he manages not to annoy the Dalek enough for him to be exterminated. And then the TARDIS lands on a sailing vessel where that ship's crew label the TARDIS crew as stowaways. And, of course, Vicky clocks Ian on the head in a bit of slapstick. And then the Daleks show up and the crew jump overboard and of course it's the Mary Celeste. The TARDIS crew have a head start before the Daleks catch up. They have to wait for some reason before heading off again and the Daleks follow in their time machine. In some places, but not on screen, it's referred to as a Dardis. <laughs> One of its operators seems to be hesitant and perhaps not qualified to perform its role. It has been suggested that this Dalek was in fact the nephew of the Dalek Supreme, so it's a Nepo Dalek. Uh, uh, in Earth time, uh, four minutes. The TARDIS's next landing is in a spooky gothic mansion of some description with vampire bats, Dracula and Frankenstein. I am Count Dracula. The Daleks land and even they can't deal with Frank and Drax. The TARDIS escapes in the nick of time and the Doctor surmises they hadn't landed anywhere in particular, but somehow in the mind. Except it turns out it was just a BBC version of Five Nights at Freddy's, complete with robots. One snag, of course, is they left Vicky behind, but she's hitched a lift in the Dalek time machine. The Daleks have a new weapon, a robot replica of the Doctor which is accurate in every detail, apart from height, shape, physical features, and sometimes his voice. But apart from that, if you squint through a pinhole covered in gauze and you've got cataracts, then it's the spitting image of the Doctor. I am to infiltrate and kill. Infiltrate and kill. The final stop, the planet Mechanus. But at first glance, there's nothing all that mechanical about the place, just a bunch of amorous mushrooms getting fungal with Vicky. The fake Doctor plot is possibly where the last shred of any remaining goodwill towards this story drained away. William Hartnell here tries to play two roles at the same time with his double, with the production relying on the low resolution of television at the time and small screens in most people's homes to get by. Also, camera five, you done goofed. And cut off any attempt to escape. The final episode decides to forget that this has been a pretty ordinary story so far and might actually give you positive vibes. The TARDIS crew are taken up into the elevated city, which turns out is inhabited by robotic mechanoids. So, calling the planet Mechanus was clearly not some random thing that Terry Nation came up with after tripping over a Meccano Dalek. The mechanoids were sent to the planet to set it up for colonization, but the colonists never arrived. But who did arrive? the crashed space pilot Steven Taylor, who looks and sounds suspiciously like Morton Dill from earlier in the same story. What do you think I'd stay here otherwise? I'm just like you. We're all prisoners. 
A battle between the Daleks and the Mechanoids ensues, and thankfully it was shot and edited on film because it almost completely makes you forget how sloppily made the rest of this story was. It's got that old film montage feel, but it works quite well. At the end of the story, Steven was separated from the escaping TARDIS crew, and with the Daleks defeated, Ian and Barbara decide they want to use the Dalek time machine to go home. And now we have a chance to go home. We want to take that chance. Ian and Barbara's departure was kind of a big deal with their arrival back on Earth celebrated on screen with <gasps> location filming, plus a stills montage. Take a look, since for the next few seasons, companion departures could be sudden and brutal, happening with little warning. Also, now that he's home again, Ian really needs to get some x-rays just in case there are any lingering effects from this, or this, or this or this, or this. We are locked in pursuit course. Calculate destination of enemy time machine. The Dalek voice processing in this story is better than that of Dalek Invasion of Earth, because here they just basically sound like their old selves again. Our time machine has been completed. Such a nice idea, but like Mary, Queen of Scots, was poorly executed. Everything about the production screams cheap, but it goes deeper than that. Terry Nation can be a really effective and creative writer, but even his closest friends and colleagues would say that he could be quite lazy on occasion, sometimes doing the bare minimum. If Terry Nation was a rock band, he'd release five volumes of his greatest hits, and all would have the exact same track listing. The chase is Terry Nation on autopilot. Right, so. Whereas Dalek Invasion of Earth kept to one location, here we have a desert planet, a sailing ship, the Empire State building, a haunted house, a jungle planet, and a robot city, all having to be constructed with a couple of hundred quid. While we still have some photographic cutout Daleks in a few spots, you might notice a few extra Dalek props in group scenes. The new props are hastily converted casings as used in the first Doctor Who movie. Now, if it is a time machine, I'm not saying it is, mind you, but if it is, shouldn't you know where we are? Steven Taylor was a space pilot from the future, though his practical knowledge of the future is rarely glimpsed, where, for all intents and purposes, he may as well have been somebody from the 1960s. Peter Purvis had been up for other parts in the series, but impressed the production team with his turn as tourist Morton Dill in The Chase, which led to him being offered the role of a continuing companion character introduced in the final episode of the exact same story. Stephen was not quite a one-for-one -one replacement for Ian Chesterton, though he would push back against the Doctor quite strongly whenever he felt the situation demanded it. Those Vikings sure know how to tie knots! Well, they saved the best for last. The time meddler starts off with the Doctor and Vicky missing Ian and Barbara. Then they find Stephen had found his way into the TARDIS and collapsed. He doesn't believe the TARDIS can travel in time, but they soon land in England in 1066, around the time of the Viking invasion. I wonder if that's at all coincidental. There are hints that everything isn't quite what it seems, which doesn't help Vicky trying to convince Stephen that they are in fact in the past. There's a chirpy monk floating about the place where he imprisons the Doctor in a monastery, and then some Vikings appear, first via the medium of stock footage, and secondly via the medium of three actors cosplaying as Thor. The monk, it seems, has a plan to change history by firing an atomic bazooka at the stock footage Viking fleet, and then the penny drops. The monk's got a TARDIS! The monk wants to change history, not out of malice, but because he thinks he can make it better. His plans to change history do make the Doctor getting involved in the affairs of various planets seem rather tame in light of his eventual punishment. But this was still years before the idea of Time Lords had been conceived of. The Monk would eventually be acknowledged as a Time Lord in spin-off media, though in his two appearances in the 60s, he'd just be somebody from the same place as the Doctor with his own TARDIS. Peter Butterworth plays an impish character rather than an outright evil moustache twirling villain. I mean, if the Monk had been put on trial, what would his defence strategy be? It's just pranks, bro. Also, let's stop and admire the name of actor Peter Butterworth. It's such a cool name. In fact, I will name my next cat. Peter Butterworth. I'm sorry, Father. It's poor fare for the likes of you. Yes, but don't distress yourself, my child. We must all be prepared to make sacrifices when they're asked of us. The Time Meddler's production values hold up mostly well. Despite being a completely studio-bound production, it just feels larger than it should. There's only two sets. There's clever use of back projection to give the studio-bound production a real sky. It's a nice touch. Director Douglas Camfield was somebody who was often able to wring the most out of a BBC television studio in the 60s and 70s. The Time Meddler mostly looks great, 
apart from apart from this fight between some Saxon villagers and the Vikings that's so amateurish that it could serve as a pilot for a new series focusing on amateurish action called Amateur Hour. Do you really believe the ancient Britons could have built Stonehenge without the aid of my anti-gravitational lift? Of course, the actual plot, had it been made much later in the series run, could have easily fit into 50 minutes, but at four episodes, it doesn't totally outstay its welcome like so many longer stories have a habit of doing, especially when you're able to watch the whole thing in one session rather than having to wait for weeks. The more I think about it, Time Meddler ends up as my personal favourite for this season, despite it being one of the least ambitious stories. Turns out, when you write something that's well within the series' resources, Lo and behold, you have a story that has dated better than anything else from this year. Now, if my memory of English history serves me right, we're about to have a Viking invasion, and very soon. The Time Meddler is the first time we will see another TARDIS. It's the first time we'll see somebody else from the Doctor's planet other than Susan, possibly the first time a top knot appeared in Doctor Who, and it's the first pseudo-historical. Up until season four, every other period story is pure history, with the TARDIS and its crew being the only anachronisms. The Time Meddler would, eventually, be a sort of template for future stories that would use the past as a setting, but with additional sci-fi elements, like an alien or a rogue time traveler. Look, I take it you both come from the same place, Doctor. Yes, I regret that we do, but I would say that I am 50 years earlier. The Time Meddler was written as a budget balancing cheapie to end the season, written by departing story editor Dennis Spooner. Donald Tosh had taken over the story editor's role, and Verity Lambert was preparing to move on from the producer's role in the next season. I've done it, I've done it, I've done it. <laughs> well, nothing's happened, Doctor. Hasn't it? Hasn't it, my dear boy? <laughs> The production of the second season followed more or less the same pattern as the first season, though most episodes were now recorded at the BBC's Riverside Studios and occasionally at the Television Centre, where the facilities were far better than those at Lime Grove used to record most of the show's first season. This gave the production team access to better cameras including, whoa, zoom lenses on the cameras, and a lot more usable space. However, they still used a system of minimal recording breaks, where the show was, for the most part, made as if it were live. Unless there was a tearing need to stop tape for something like a major special effect, mistakes were left in. Yes, in the normal uh, progress of time, uh, my dear, I would say, uh, yeah, I would agree with you, but um, unfortunately, we got to face the Daleks. So if you wanted to show your cast against a major vista, you could have them stand in front of a back projection screen, or you could simply mix two images and hope viewers wouldn't notice your actors seemed slightly transparent. If the director wanted to do anything fancy, their best bet was to use their meagre budget for a filmed set piece, usually shot at Elang Studios. While the chase is reasonably slapdash in its overall production, the climactic battle between the Daleks and Mechanoids was shot and edited together on film, with it being the single most impressive scene in the entire season. If old cocky licking comes round, I've always got this. For the show's second season, Planet of the Giants is a yawn fest. The Dalek invasion of Earth is epic, but requires a lot of people having the exact same thought for the story to work, and it also bites off far more than it can chew. The rescue is a short palate cleanser. While the Romans tries to make an historical epic without the epic part, the web planet aims for the moon, but in terms of production values, blows up on the launch pad. The Crusade is Shakespeare in space and time. The Space Museum is one good episode let down by three unsatisfying runaround episodes. Utterly unbelievable. Damn straight, Doctor. The chase tries to throw the kitchen sink at the screen and ends up with the BBC getting a bill for a new screen, while the time meddler aims rather lower, yet succeeds as a result. Doctor, look! There's more of them! If everybody had an ocean across the USA, then everybody'd be safe in California. You see, they're wearing their baggies, the right sandals too. This was at a time when the program makers had unbridled confidence to reach for the sky, but without convincing the BBC higher-ups to reach a little deeper into their pockets. Ratings were some of the highest the series would ever see. I mean, a few episodes pipped 13 million viewers. That's anywhere up to a maximum of 13 million children crying at the end of episode one of The Romans because there were no monsters. The third season would see a new broom sweep through Doctor Who, a broom which would itself be quickly swept away and replaced by an even newer broom. 
there would be new companions, new behind the scenes crew, and season 3 would also have even more Daleks in the longest story attempted so far. Yes, you realise of course we're taking a terrible chance. If you enjoyed this review, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos. You can catch them